Hi, Ian, and uh, welcome everyone to our webinar on a new niche in retail and facility management today. Thank you for joining us today. It's always a pleasure to see all of the people who join us. I can see their names as they come along. It's great. As Ian said, my name is David McAdam. I am the CEO of the Middle East Council of Shopping Centers and Retailers. Our team is here and is pleased to be part of the webinar today. So it's a pleasure for us to be part of this. We are here to support everyone in the retail industry and beyond. We have many, many different ways to reach out to everyone in, in the industry, in the retail industry, in the building industry, in the GCC and beyond, even in far, as far as Western and Central Asia. So we have our Retail People magazine. We also have our directory, which is on digital format. Both of these are in digital format this year. We also have our voice on demand and our video on demand. So we also have our ability for everyone to reach out to others in the industry. So we welcome anyone who's interested to come forward and join us for a podcast or join us for a video on demand. We also have a fabulous new education program uh, called the GVS Digital Platform. We have over 50 different modules that are laid out and a number of different instructors from around the world to help you with that. We also have our WhatsApp retail newsletter that comes out every month, which keeps you up to date on what's going on in the industry. And lastly, but not least, we have, we have hosted a number of great webinars over the past several months, and we continue to do that in the future. So first of all, we thank you to do that, to, to join us. As you may know, the Middle East Council of Shopping Centers and Retailers have been offering free one-year membership to our organization for those who have lost their jobs in the past months. We know this is a difficult time and we want to reach out to you to help you. So just send an email to membership at mecsc.org to qualify for your one year free membership with us. We offer our job placement service an year into the market and the GCC and beyond. We offer you uh, an opportunity to write articles in the What's Up monthly newsletter, our Retail People magazine, speak in our podcast, as I mentioned, uh, with our professional in-house team, take courses with our GVS program to raise your personal profile in the industry. So there are so many ways we can reach out for you. We have a great lineup of industry professionals with us today on this webinar. Thank you for joining us on this. Our moderator today and the editor of the Clean Middle East magazine and webinar presenter, Shanti Patwala, over to you now as our moderator for the day. And thank you very much again for joining us. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, uh, David, for your wonderful welcome address. Uh, good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us today. I am Shanti Petiwala, the editor of Clean Middle East magazine, a 13-year-old publication focusing on commercial cleaning and hygiene in the Middle East region. Before we proceed with today's webinar, let me introduce you to our panel of experts. We have with us Andrea Deutschbein, the Director of FM Soft Services at Imar Facilities Management and Imar Malls. Andrea is an accomplished soft services FM specialist with more than 22 years of broad and diversified corporate FM strategic planning and implementing technical and operational experience in facilities management. She's a specialist in managing major soft FM operations in various locations such as Germany, Qatar, and the UAE. David McAdam, who you just saw a little while ago, is the Chief Executive Officer of the Middle East Council of Shopping Centers and Retailers. With a career spanning 39 years in the retail industry, David brings an unrivaled understanding of global retail real estate, portfolio management, and retail business development. With years of technical expertise and leadership skills, David is responsible for driving the MECSR organization's corporate vision in the MENA region. Julian Khalil is the Director of Soft Services at Farnik Services. Julian has over 17 years of experience in the FM industry in Germany and the Middle East. His role involves the strategic, financial and operational development of the soft services divisions of Farnik across the UAE, as well as the implementation of smart and green solutions to improve service excellence and customer satisfaction. And finally, we have Manuela Gata the Education and Certification Director at ISSA International. Manuela is responsible for leading ISSA's efforts to enhance and promote professionalism, industry standards, and best practices across the cleaning industry through CIMS accreditation, training courses, and blended educational initiatives in Europe, 
the Middle East, Africa, Oceania, and the Asia Pacific regions. So welcome ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for being with us today. So let's start the conversation without uh, any further ado uh, with the one thing that's on everyone's mind. How has the new normal been for you all? And how have each of you coped with the changes that the pandemic has brought with it from an industry perspective? So let's start with Andrea. Hi. First of all, thank you for having me there. Um, yeah, I believe uh, we had uh, different, several different situation. Uh, in, we had first the post uh, uh, pandemic, then the lockdown came, then we had uh, the past uh, lockdown and uh, we had to adapt to all those different situation, um, which uh, was new for everyone, I believe, not only for, for our facility and, and in our region, this is a, a new experience we all or most of us faced the first time. And uh, we had to act very uh, flexible, very fast, uh, but also uh, needed to know, okay, what is actually the requirement where we have to look into what, what uh, has to be on place. And uh, on top of this, uh, the difficulties of the lockdown came uh, where supplies been short because it has happened everywhere throughout the globe and not just in one country or in one city or in one facility. We all face the same issue and uh, everyone had the same requirement at the same time. So it has uh, several uh, different situation at one time is how you how you maintain your facility in the same way, uh, uh, have the ensure the highest standard uh, by actually having less money because uh, income also has been stopped. So the budget has been cut. Uh, so you still have the, the same requirements and you need it to be very, um, uh, yeah, like how can I say, um, had a lot of new ideas. You needed to get new ideas. You need, really needed to look into what is necessary, what we can maybe cut from everything, what has to be there. And it was uh, quite a challenge, but I also think it was an, um, an, open, an, an open door for, uh, for new thinking, for a new, um, for restructuring the, the, the entire operation. And uh, we really saw it as an opportunity, not as a threat. And um, this has helped us actually a lot. Um, one big part of this is also to the, the realization that you cannot maintain a facility, any kind of facility um, if you do not work together with all the stakeholders. So it is not just maintenance or FM alone. You have occupancies in the building, no matter which kind of building, whether it is a, a shopping mall, it's an office, it's a residential building, it is a school, there are uh, occupants inside and uh, you are not just a facility manager anymore. You need to work with them together because you need to explain what is happening, what are your actions, uh, what is the, uh, the reaction out of it. So you have a, a cost cutting, you still have a requirement, you need to explain this is what I need to do to ensure um, the standard is there, but I can do it only with this amount. So there is an action or there is something happening behind, something cannot be done anymore. You need to explain to avoid the question which will come. So if you just start, okay, I don't have the money more, I stop cleaning here, I don't supply this anymore, I will not, I will not shampooing, I will not disinfect or whatever it is. Uh, and, and you have not informed your stakeholders, everyone will raise question mark and your complaints start and you actually, it's not your fault because you don't get the money. So you need to explain, um, okay, I can help you. I can save you this money. I can cut the cost, but this is the consequences of this. Are you agree with this? At the same time, when it comes to shopping malls, for example, what we always see, we are maintaining the common area, full stop. But the tenants is not part of the common area. And um, they need to comply to our standards too. So how do they get the knowledge? How do they know what, uh, what they have to do? What are the requirements? So it's our job as a facility manager to ensure they are educated, go to the tenants. And this was actually the first time that we had this uh, connection as partner, not as 
you know, I am the developer, you are my tenant. Uh, and it's not, it's not just about a service fee. It's really about working together, uh, train, educate, getting the standard help, uh, offer services in a different way with, uh, with, with uh, um, the Louis Laura rate, working with our service provider together. Uh, during the lockdown, for example, we had the situation if our uh, service provider is gone now because we have a lockdown, what's happened after the lockdown? Do I get my employees back or they are gone? And how, how do we mobilize this again? Yeah. And um, because they cannot hold the, 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 the employees if they don't have a work forever, it's, it's obvious. And we also did know that we will not require the entire manpower uh, again. So we needed to find a way to work with all the service providers, with all tenants, with all the, uh, t uh, the stakeholders, with our management, because they also have expectation, how, how can we um, manage this? And we realized that we actually had a lot of um, tasks before lockdown. It was nice to do, but it wasn't really necessary. So we stopped this. We also changed timing, we changed maintenance timing. We don't have a night shift anymore, for example, um, which has helped us a lot getting the manpower there when we need them, but, uh, uh, and still have an, an, a requirement. We had uh, meetings with supplier, um, have the, have the uh, locked prices, have locked, um, you know, the, 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 the supplies we needed that we're getting it on time and uh, when we need but you cannot fill uh, the entire storeroom with, with the supplies for a month because you don't have the space so you need to have agreement with supplier how we can manage this um, right. uh, can we move on to david please uh, david can you tell us a little about how the new normal has been for you as well sure thank you uh, thank you um, we, uh, our team at the Middle East Council of Shopping Centers and Retailers had to pivot quickly from where we were. We uh, immediately moved to home, work from home as we did. But what happened was is that many of our, uh, we had over a thousand members and we have 875 shopping centers and many of our members were reaching out to us asking us, well, what do we do? What do you suggest? Where are we at? What's going to, what does the future look like? So we were, um, we were hard pressed to really determine what to do. We hosted some webinars quickly with, uh, with Sweden and uh, people from Sweden and Moscow and uh, Los Angeles and other places to figure out really what we should be doing. So uh, it was an interesting time for us and uh, we were helpful to, I think, a lot of our members to help them to understand the, the magnitude of the issue and what's going on. But let me start with something else. For those who don't know, facility management is a profession that encompasses multiple disciplines to ensure functionality, comfort, safety, efficiency uh, of, of operating built up of uh, environments, so buildings or shopping centers. But they, they do this, the facility management do this by integrating people, places, processes, and technology. And it's all about now, it's all about health and well-being. So what's interesting is facilities management was in the past something that was more back of house, but facilities management has risen in importance quickly with the arrival of the pandemic to be the, at the forefront of our business in shopping centers and retail. Facility managers have come from the back of the house to the highly visible leading edge of the customer experience. And this is the first time. So what's happened is we've found that there are five or six new leading trends that I think are going to be interesting for you to, to understand. The first leading trend for facilities management now is a greater emphasis on employee and customer health and wellness. This wasn't necessarily at the forefront before. The second thing is, it's equally important, is safety and hygiene. Now, Yes, facilities management people were always responsible for being, ensuring that there was a safety and, and a very hygienic location, but now it's taken it to another level. And I think that's the very important part for it too. The other thing that's happened with facilities management recently is, is a, there's a long-term partnership that has come about between the retailers and the shopping center owners and other building owners um, with how to manage what's going on. So we find that to be a very interesting sort of a, a change. 
There's a smart workplace in shopping centers now, and it's data-driven decision-making. So whereas before it was more about uh, walking around and making sure things were clean, now it's data-driven and people are expecting all of the shopping centers and all of the different uh, stakeholders to take uh, notice of what is necessary to do. So it, it's a very important part of it. And then past that, the use of artificial intelligence and other integrated software programs has become even more important for the facilities management people because uh, globally this is a pandemic and the information is shared now globally about what different shopping centers are doing. We've had the fortune of having some information from some of these shopping centers around the world. So we've shared that with our members. But it's really important to understand that it's, uh, it's really about now uh, a shared knowledge uh, using artificial intelligence and long-term partnerships. So some of these new um, software programs that have come out that have been very helpful. Um, there's been one called Robin Powered. There's Space IQ, Tracker Pal. There's just so many of these uh, integrated software facilities that have helped people in the shopping center business and the facilities management business to get on top of the hygienic needs that are required. So uh, back to you, Shanti. That's, that's what we had done and that's where we're at right now. Thank you so much, David. Uh, let's move on to Julian. So Julian. Can you tell us a little about the new normal and how it's been for you at Panic? Hi, hi Shanti, good evening and thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so I think, I mean, Andrea and David already, um, you know, described a bit how I think everybody experienced the last four months. And I think in the very beginning, uh, when it was clear that it is a pandemic, and we could also see that every country actually acted or interacted with the, the new reality a bit different. Uh, it was a big adaptation to, to understand, you know, what are the right steps. A lot of ideas came in from everywhere around the world. Uh, is it from customers, from service providers, from suppliers trying to bring innovations in, um, new solutions, chemicals to, to help fight it. Um, Business-wise, obviously, I think uh, the shutdown affected everybody. Uh, the same also service providers and uh, some of our sites uh, were uh, in a lockdown and accordingly there was no requirement uh, for cleaning, at least for a specific time frame. Um, I think as a service provider, the, the biggest effect which happened to us is that before the pandemic, there used to be an output specific contract. Uh, we had very clear and strict KPIs performances, which uh, were a lot wrapped around um, not only cleaning related things, but when it comes to management, reporting, uh, etc. and co. And uh, now um, going through the pandemic and with the, with the reopening of the facilities, um, a lot of clients are much more involved in looking what is actually necessary. I think cleaning somehow rationalized a bit, um, uh, trying to remove obviously also with budget constraints and pressure from the commercial side, uh, unnecessary steps, unnecessary uh, tasks, and looking um, uh, at a more confident cleaning, focusing on the hygiene aspects. Um, the funny part is actually as a cleaning company, as a cleaning professional, uh, this is what we used to do even before the pandemic. Uh, if you think uh, whatever protocols, um, uh, SOPs, uh, materials, chemicals were part of the cleaning process, all of them were part in for example, avoiding cross-contamination, uh, disinfecting, uh, reducing the bacterial or viral loads, um, and were not necessarily focused uh, only on representation of a facility. And uh, I think for us, the, the biggest part is that this has become more, more the focus during the pandemic. Um, people are suddenly interested, you know, what color microfiber is used in their office. Um, we had a lot of discussion about disinfectants, um, and more people are involved in the discussion trying to understand terminologies like contact time of a disinfectant. And I think um, with that in the long term, I believe that cleaning um, plays a much bigger role. Yeah? Um, I think it became clear that um, not only the pharmaceuticals are so a part of you know, uh, prolonging life and, and defending us against pandemics, but cleaning plays a major role uh, even before that. And I think this control and this focus uh, will, will further determine that um, to, to actually strengthen the cleaning industry. Uh, nevertheless, I think to, to recover from that, uh, it will take uh, um, quite a bit time. 
And uh, until now, we also believe that we don't know what's happening in the next three to six months. There are talks about a second wave, uh, etc. And hence, I think a long-term planning at the moment is uh, a bit difficult business-wise as well. So it is much more important to, to look now really at a framework which uh, we as a service provider can, can comply with. And um, this is something which we found uh, actually also through ISSA and uh, it's uh, GBAC accreditation where uh, we were looking at, at our processes and what we do on client side and looking that we are confidently can comply with an international standard um, which we are um, following and uh, it's really trying to avoid unnecessary uh, irrational process steps yeah, which we um, have seen and resource uh, uh, waste for example you know applying disinfectant everywhere and too much which in the end does not help uh, uh, the purpose to, to keep a hygiene and, and clean environment back to you Shanti. thank you so much julian and finally we have manuela uh, manuela tell us a little about the new normal for you Thank you. Thank you all for, uh, for your presentations and introduction. Well, I, I really believe that uh, difficult times do not uh, build a character, but uh, reveal it. And I'm really proud as uh, we reacted as an association, but also as uh, an industry in uh, managing and responding uh, to the challenges that the crisis has uh, brought to us. Uh, as, uh, the Worldwide Association for the Cleaning Industry, we really represent the entire value chain. We represent FM, cleaning contractors, distributors, manufacturers, uh, training. So we, we really uh, felt that we had like a social responsibility to help all the industry as well as the industry and the users. And basically this meant that we uh, had to be really fast in making sure we would bring the right information, uh, uh, solid uh, uh, information to our clients. We saw that uh, society, even cleaning professionals who had a lot of experience actually reacted a little bit with panic to the crisis. And we really needed to make sure that uh, uh, responsible uh, cleaning, that uh, important, um, information were delivered to the key decision makers as well as the cleaning uh, professionals and that uh, we could that we had to really uh, promote uh, prof professional cleaning responsible cleaning confidence cleaning as uh, julian uh, said uh, we are seeing uh, have seen and we are still seeing strange terminology coming on board sterilization of uh, offices uh, so it's uh, it was really and it's still really important to ensure uh, that we uh, approach cleaning as a science and that we bring solid evidence uh, of the information we are sharing and also i mean the industry has really the industry the crisis has really given the industry a great opportunity uh, to 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 show the importance of what we do and uh, as i keep saying we are not cleaning anymore for aesthetics or we are not only cleaning for aesthetics and appearance we are cleaning for health and i think this is the major lesson learned that we as an industry uh, learned because of the crisis and that this lesson learned needs to stay with us. And the cleaning for health means a series of things. It brings some implications. It means that we really need to make sure that we train our staff. We need to make we need to make sure that we, as cleaning professionals, but also as the end users, implement quality systems, procedures, protocols that are strong, that are consistent, and that are based on on scientific basis. And I'm also a bit, I'm proud of ICSA because actually we had that, we made the timely decision uh, last year to acquire the Global Bio Risk Advisory Council, which was mainly created to really deal with pandemics, such as the one we are experiencing now, with the absolute effectiveness and uh, absolute integrity. And uh, that uh, has uh, really helped the association to support uh, the industry. And uh, we are uh, uh, glad that the Bio-Risk Advisory Council is, uh, is there because it's really brought a lot of important information 
that uh, was really, <laughs> really, really uh, needed uh, in this panic uh, environment that we had to move. Very interesting, uh, you know, very interesting points have come across through all of your presentations. One that, uh, one of them that really stuck with me was what uh, Julian just said, you know, uh, he spoke about how it's not just the pharmaceutical companies that are uh, the main people responsible for, you know, uh, you know, healing uh, people or preventing a pandemic. You also have the cleaners and this has come to the forefront time and again in the past five months. Uh, but it, you know, it goes down to the point where we're talking about the people who are actually doing the cleaning. We can sit and we can talk about protocols and KPIs and all of that. But what about the people who are actually going out there, donning the suits, uh, wearing the right PPE and trying to, uh, you know, uh, keep their fears at bay while actually cleaning the environment? So tell me, uh, all of you, a little about uh, the kind of training protocols that have changed since the pandemic and what kind of support um, must we and have we been giving to our frontline cleaners and workers? Uh, the floor is open to any of you all who would like to answer this. Yes, Julie. Yes, <laughs> thanks, Shanti. Um, Thank you. So, uh, yeah, maybe to, to start with, I think in the beginning, everybody was very uh, insecure. Can I go out? Do I get affected? And obviously the same, I think everybody felt around the world, uh, obviously the frontline staff felt too. Um, so it was um, at the time, I think still obviously the authorities and worldwide, nobody was really clear on how the virus, you know, progresses, how dangerous it is and how infectious, etc. But um, like, for example, what, what we went through, and this is why we also went for the GBAC accreditation is to establish a protocol which gives us confidence that we're making the right choices. And one big part is PPE. Yeah, I think uh, we all have been suddenly exposed. The whole world now knows the, the abbreviation PPE. Um, a lot of people can tell you differences of face masks and, and how good and bad they are or, or whatever. And I think this was a big part, right? And, and how uh, as a cleaning uh, um, company or an FM company, we are able to actually ensure or limit the risks on our frontline stuff. So selection of PPE, how to use it, how to put it on, uh, is something definitely which intensified in the training process for all our staff. Yeah. Um, additionally, from the, the, the cleaning protocols, I think the, the whole definition, and uh, Manuela mentioned it uh, before, what is the difference between sanitization, disinfection, and sterilization is also something where people became uh, pretty much aware. and. Um, I think this is uh, something which, which uh, started to be implemented in all the processes. Uh, disinfectants are now used almost in every step of the cleaning. Uh, important is that cleaning is not forgotten. Yeah, And this is also something, uh, I think if there's a tissue lying on the floor, just spraying a disinfectant on it is not sufficient, right? The tissue has to be uh, removed first. Um, yeah, and I think from a training perspective, so going through the PPE, re-establishing the new SOPs and, and giving confidence in the people how to, to execute them was one of the biggest uh, parts which changed for us in the training. I, I would like to, uh, to add to that. Really, when it comes to cleaning and disinfection, we really wanted to support the facilities in showing that they're building occupiers, in showing them the building occupiers, that the facility has done the best possible to reduce the, the risk of contracting the virus, of the risk of the virus entering the facility. But doing the best mm -hmm. doesn't mean overdoing, as Julian saying, but it means implementing what we call the confidence cleaning, which is really uh, the the, the importance of conduct a proper risk assessment is very important, I think, for the facility, since we are talking with facilities managers uh, today, to understand what their goal is first. Most locations uh, are not uh, healthcare or occupied by high risk citizens. So most of the locations are really looking for an increased frequency of cleaning and the possible addition to that the disinfection, because this is a two steps process. It's always so to good to, to make sure that the facility manager asks himself, like, what is our goal first? Do we want to reduce the risk of cross contamination of high touch surface? Do we want to increase the peace of mind of our occupancy, uh, occupants, or uh, we ha have a like real uh, concern that someone in the building has tested positive and then we need to step up our cleaning. 
after they ask themselves those questions, they, they need to really conduct that risk assessment in person to identify with their cleaning contractors or in-house operatives, what are the, the critical area, the touch uh, points, what is the usage of the customers. On the basis of that, after the risk assessment has taken place, really identify what are the steps for cleaning and eventually for disinfection that will give the occupiers the assurance that this place is now safe and health. And risk assessment is at core of what we, as I say, advocate for with confidence cleaning. If I can add uh, to, to Julian and uh, Manuela, so, um, we, are, we are now from the development side, so we are not cleaning ourselves, we manage the cleaning team. Uh, however, uh, we, our own team also had to, to uh, receive training uh, what is necessary because, as I said, we are not the cleaner itself. So um, they, they needed to understand what are the, the, the steps need to be done. Uh, we are receiving, for example, guidelines from municipality. So how do I break those guidelines down to, to our team, to the service provider? as well to the tenants because uh, you know when, when it came to opening reopening of the facility uh, there have been a lot of uh, guidelines from, from um, municipality uh, which was sent to tenants but uh, what they do with this so they need to understand what are the requirements and how can they comply to it so we, we did a lot of training sessions with, uh, with the tenant itself um, to help them uh, another point is the mental um, yeah mental stress actually because uh, it's in one side um, do I can get infected uh, or when we had this lockdown uh, the facility was never 100% not lockdown there are still in every facility in every building uh, systems they need to run uh, you still have people there they, you still have to enter uh, the, the hygiene is done the cleaning is done uh, in, in a mall for example you had uh, a, a um, and a supermarket or pharmacy been open, so you still had public, public there. So it, it needed to be done in the, in the same way, but uh, with maybe one, two people. And because the lockdown was there for 24 hours, so you could not just go easily out and in. Uh, so it was necessary that we preparing rooms for them to, to stay in the facility. And they've been staying there for almost a week and could not go out. They don't have any contact to the, uh, to the, to the families or anything. So this is a, a mental pressure for, for the employees where we also have to look into and, and to look after and to motivate. And um, I believe this, uh, then you have to uncertainty if, if I can maybe lose my job or is, you know, do I have my job tomorrow or doing or the, do I have my salary tomorrow or is there maybe only 50% or 20% of salary? We, we all went through this process and uh, we all have you know, even if they cut something, you still have your cost. So you still need 100% of your of your employees to perform. And, and this is something now which has been changed as a, as a manager, for example, how you have to take care uh, for, your, for your employees and how you motivate them and how you get them still on track and what can you do and how, how can you help. So this is a totally different... Um, a situation which we never faced before as a facility manager. Yeah, um, and the other side also, you see that uh, we don't know really hundred percent what is COVID nineteen. There's every day a new research, every day a new information from uh, WHO or other organizations about uh, COVID nineteen. Um, it, it took a while before we did know that is airborne, for example, before it was denied. So we have to be flexible and permanent, um, uh, inform ourselves about the, the situation and what can we do. And this is uh, something we really have to, um, it's our responsibility as a facility manager that we are always alert and ahead uh, of, of all the information and research, but research on the, on the correct uh, channels, because this is an, another issue that uh, a lot of information came out um, they are absolutely wrong and do more damage than, than good. And uh, I can understand a lot of suppliers, for example, they've been so demanding to get the business. So they are telling you anything else, uh, you know, but this is uh, what the product they want to sell can do uh, without any test, without any proof. 
and if the if it's some to uh, to uh, to someone who is not really uh, trained on the situation and, and knows what is necessary cannot identify is it true or not so you spend a lot of money maybe for for uh, unnecessary things or you do more damage than than they need it and this is something we this was really a pressure in those times completely understand um tell me uh, a little about training you spoke about uh, suppliers coming up with uh, these kind of uh, you know uh, these kind of answers that you know their product can say for instance deal 100% you know that completely eradicate viruses and bacteria and all of these things how important for you uh, how important is training and certification for you for both the supplier side as well as the service provider side as an end user as a client how important are these things for you right now yeah, especially it, it is important i mean if i spend the money, as i said in the beginning first of all you don't have the money uh, available just like uh, you know that you do to start in a big pot and take the money so the money has to be spent by it, and it has to be spent for the right products and uh, and if i if i have a hand sanitizer which is necessary um I can have the fancy product which costs maybe whatever four thousand dollar because it has a nice stainless steel body and it's shining and whatever it has a sensor. But at the end, inside the pouches is a is a hand sanitizer which I get in every other manual, normal plastic dispenser for food. So you have to make the decision: is it more the look uh, has it to be look fancy or is it the function? So I have to go for the function. This is where I will decide. In the other side is the, the um, you know, certification for um, an, a product. The certification should be a certification from a third party and proof and um, uh, not from a laboratory, laboratory environment. A lot of products been tested in the lab, but not in the reality. So there is, because this COVID-19 is so new, nobody has really the research, is it, is it uh, proven if a product comes and says, uh, you know, you just put it uh, one time there and it will stay for six yeah. weeks or, or six months and you don't need to disinfect anymore. I don't have to prove for this because we don't have COVID so long. Yeah. yeah. And, and this, it, this makes it very difficult to decide which product shall I use now. So we go back to the to the uh, knowing products where we have the food, yeah, or it's recommended. For example, like organization I have to say, or for uh, uh, dean uh, norms, yeah. So we, we have to go for this. Okay, uh, Julian, have you uh, experienced this as well? Do you find your end user clients uh, being more demanding for? Uh, trainings and certification uh, and standards at the service provider level. Yeah, I think it's it's more about the confidence, right? Uh, I think everybody also as in, in uh, our clients, they uh, they want to make sure that they're doing the right thing. Um, and I think this insecurity, which I mentioned before, was uh, there, especially in the first uh, couple of months uh, during lockdown and etc. And um, I think uh, at this stage we. As I mentioned, we came into much deeper discussions with our clients about things where it uh, was before more our topic as an uh, you know service provider, as an expert, which uh, the client would not interfere too much, which chemicals we're using, uh, how exactly is the SOP structured and all that. And uh, yeah, from this, definitely um, a certification uh, uh, helps, which is based on, on scientific approaches. And this is also something I think uh, very much important to mention that um, there's a lot of certifications potentially out there already. I'm, I'm not so aware, but that it's scientifically based uh, and, and not uh, just an, you know, kind of a uh, seal which you can put on a facility or, uh, um, you know, show as a company, but uh, in the end, it's your own developed uh, um, system and, and process. Yeah, it has to be somehow backed uh, scientifically and by uh, uh, international standards. Um, Manuela, can you tell us a little about the certifications that ISSA has, uh, you know, towards uh, the pandemic, specifically to, for the pandemic right now? 
Yes, thank you, Shanti. I, I think really for the audience we have today, and uh, Julian and Andrea already mentioned, the GBAC star accreditation would really provide that validation, that element of trust uh, and confidence that we were uh, referring to. Especially because, as they say, there is so much uh, uh, confusion or so much an overload of information that uh, actually having your procedure protocols validated by a third party is going to uh, really prove what you are doing, but uh, also create that element of trust. And uh, GBAC star is the, uh, the cleaning industry only outbreak, pre uh, outbreak prevention, response and recovery accreditation for facilities. These programs really help uh, publics and commercial facilities from different kinds of size or in, in different uh, kinds of uh, sectors and uh, vertical establish and maintain a cleaning disinfection and infection disease prevention program. To, minimize, to minimize the risk associated with infection agents and biohazard. This accreditation really gives you uh, not only the, inst the tools and the, the knowledge, the expertise that you need to respond uh, to the crisis, but also to mitigate <laughs> the, the the risk of, uh, of infection disease. And they are not only COVID-19, they are many, like even the flu. How are you protecting uh, your, uh, your visitors, or your tenants, or your staff? And also going back to the mental health uh, uh, point that uh, Andrea was mentioning, if you can uh, prove and if you can show your, uh, your staff that you are actually investing in these protocols, in these procedures, and this is are validated by a third party, then there is another element of confidence that the, the, the staff will have and they will feel more uh, motivated. Because also the, the, achieve, the, the GBAC star accreditation, the, to achieve it, a facility must demonstrate the compliance with the 20 elements of the programs. And going back to training, going back to tools, these 20 principles really range from standard operating procedures, risk assessment strategies, the PPE, the training, the emergency preparedness and response measures that the facility has implemented. And we are also going to launch a certification for a cleaning service company, GBAC uh, Star Services, because the GBAC Star is for facilities, but we will also launch the one for the cleaning contractors where they will uh, have to demonstrate they have the ability to really carry on those uh, outbreak cleaning and the disinfection measures that the client is requiring. Uh, David, what kind of uh, you know requirements have you seen for uh, training and accreditation from your membership? Have there been these kind of requests that have come to you as an association as well? Sure, uh, Shanti, thanks for that question because that's a big pillar of our success as an organization in the Middle East Council of Shopping Centers and Retailers. We have uh, a great number of students every year who come to our organization looking for uh, information, knowledge, and, and the support of that information and knowledge from our uh, people who are the leaders in the industry. And so we're able to, uh, and we're able to enable our students, our people in the industry, to learn more and to actually uh, graduate with some kind of a uh, certificate diploma that uh, means something in the in the job market first of all, and also uh, and enables them to know more about what they're doing every day in their business. So, yes, it's very important. Yes, we continue with it, and yes, that's as I said before, one of the pillars of uh, our success as an organization. We've had a couple of questions uh, from the audience early on uh, when they registered for the webinar, and they're going to be. I'm I'm kind of combining that with my next question. So we're talking about. What are the various um, cleaning and hygiene tools and products that are recommended to manage outbreak prevention? And what kind of alternate technologies are currently in the market uh, that have been proven effective? So we had a question uh, uh, from Mr. Samuel Koshi asking about, are you implementing any scientific methods and technologies into cleaning, like infrared, robotics, uh, drones, et cetera? 
So I'm just throwing it open, whoever would like to take up the question. I think like we already mentioned, it's important to go to the basics of, basics of good cleaning. But of course, if uh, this infection mm. is, uh, is needed and also to bring the cleaning to the next phase, we really could, uh, could consider uh, the use of technology such as, uh, but not limited to electrostatic sprayers, automations, robotics, like autonomous, autonomous cleaning. Uh, validation meters, microfiber towels, to really trying to increase uh, efficiency and uh, effectiveness uh, of uh, what uh, we are trying to achieve with our cleaning uh, and disinfection uh, efforts. Um, yeah, I just wanted to actually say in general, I think uh, the, the movement into more technology to support the operations, make, uh, you know, provide efficiencies and be more productive was already there before the pandemic. Uh, I think we, we, we step all in just developing softwares, we, smart washrooms, um, um, other technology sensors implemented across facilities to, to you know, uh, uh, inform us where cleaning is required. Um, robotics machine uh, uh, manufacturers came out with several autonomous robot uh, scrubbers. Um, and I think the, the, the trend was there before. Um, the question from, for us is obviously now looking from a disinfection point of view, um, what are the innovations there? Or when I say innovations, it's actually the, the systems were pretty much there before. And when we're talking about disinfection, we can talk about the physical disinfection or chemical disinfection. And um, obviously chemical disinfection, everybody uh, um, applied it, is it alcohol or any uh, acids or so? On the other hand, physical um, uh, disinfection like pasteurization or, or burning something. And, and uh, looking at technologies and machines which are implemented there, UV light, for example, is an option. But in practical, um, we have seen, for example, um, um, it is difficult, not always in, in every way to applicable. And I think these commercial solutions uh, to implement it are still uh, in progress. Yeah. Uh, to, to come online. But um, I think in the long term, um, like the, the question, you know, confirmed on AI, machine learning, um, everybody started with this. Uh, we're all running on, on softwares uh, where we put our plans in, uh, customer complaints are directly uh, managed and, uh, you know, registered, tracked. Um, as I said, smart technologies have been implemented and uh, in supporting this, and this will definitely go up. Um, but some of these technologies still have to find its real effectiveness and obviously commercially need to be more uh, yeah, uh, viable. So we shall move on to the next question, which talks about what's the new standard and plan for another way in case of any accidents in the future in fashion, retail and malls? Uh, this has been asked to us by Mr. Mubarak al Inazi from the Arabian Centers Company. Uh, any of you would like to take this up? So basically, in case of any future, any accidents in the future. So I assume that uh, he's talking about um, in, in case of any kind of pandemic or any kind of situation like this in the future, what kind of standard and plan or protocol should be in place already? Yeah. So maybe we can refer to the second wave, uh, yeah. you know, that everyone's talking about. If I may, can answer this question. Please, of please. And what, what has helped us during this time already uh, was the preparation of the business continuity plan, uh, which has included the pandemic plan and then the uh, infection uh, control plan. And this is, I think, it's not just for a second wave or for this COVID-19. We can have a specific in a mall. You can always have any kind of, of virus because you have a lot of people are coming through there, uh, tourists, uh, residents, you don't know them. Thing. So um, that can be a nanovirus, that can be any kind of, that can be a big fire, that can be, anything can happen. So uh, in every facility, not just in the in, in detail and more, you should have a business continuity plan where you have your risk assessment and uh, for any kind of uh, crisis that can occur and you should have, um, uh, yeah, as I said, a plan for this. Um, we cannot predict any accident or, or a pandemic and, and, and what will happen. So um, we can only plan for it and be, and be uh, aware that uh, we will be prepared. This is the only thing what we can do. Because you cannot say, oh, okay, that will be happen um, 
an, another virus or another disease. We can assume this is, yeah. Uh, we can learn from what is happening this time and can implement what we have learned. This is the most important part and, uh, and hope for the best. Thank you so much, Andrea. Uh, I just want to ask all the participants, uh, in case you all have any questions, uh, please raise your hands in the chat box. We have uh, just a few uh, minutes to go before we end. So in case you all have any questions, please raise your hand. Uh, we have a question from Joe's Lucos. Uh, I have a question uh, regarding, you know, this um, public system for disinfecting individuals, like spraying in tunnels or chambers. Is that really recommended at this situation? <laughs> Please. <laughs> Uh, Very important question. Yes, this is where the uh, people uh, being divided. So that is really, um, <laughs> we we don't. <laughs> our focus is still on uh, you know providing the 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 highest hygiene by uh, cleaning and disinfecting the surfaces and every touch point rather than uh, spraying individuals. So. Um, from, yeah. from our side, my side, I can only say it's not recommended. So yeah. um, I would not be, uh, I would not like to get the, the spray in, in, in my body. Yeah. Uh, I think Manuela can, can respond yeah. better. <laughs> yeah. 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 Anyway, uh, some of the companies like in Abu Dhabi, RT and all, they started already to, you know, after this lockdown. That's what yeah. I asked. Yeah. Yes, we, we don't recommend spraying uh, people uh, as uh, I say, say, we focus on the surfaces and we focus on that risk uh, assessment approach that I mentioned. So like, uh, and uh, after you conduct the risk assessment, you will know which are the steps that you need to conduct and they include the like, uh, right tools, the right uh, training, uh, the right uh, uh, surfaces to, to, to clean and disinfect and the humans is not so what so we <laughs> include in those steps and, and, and frequencies. So we understand, uh, we understand that there is a need of providing that confidence and trust and this kind of tunnels uh, uh, seems that uh, like can, can, can are very visible, uh, but there are, and there are better ways and more efficient and a more sensitive way to, 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 to do that. Uh, we have a question from Fajr in Pomanto. So basically, he wants to know how you can prevent people uh, yes, who may be yes. potentially infected from uh, entering your building or solve that as an issue. So any comments on this? Yeah, I mean, uh, thermo, thermo, um, control, thermo camera, for example, installation or, uh, could be a help at uh, preventing uh, uh, infected people coming inside the building by uh, temperature control. An easier uh, and, and a simple temperature control already can help. Of course, everyone has responsibility and we should bear our mask. And I cannot uh, um, yeah. say it oft, this much often. Uh, bear the mask, take it serious and not easily. Please wear the mask to save you and your oversight. This is the most important part. Uh, important part yeah? um, I mean, you cannot. How will you know that the, the person who wants to enter the building is infected if he doesn't have any symptoms? So we can we can do the thermal uh, uh, measurement or the, the yeah, temperature measurement, but if it doesn't have an, an, um, a symptom, you will not know that why we are the mask and ensure that uh, the building is being disinfected. And, and also Thank you so much. If I can add, also making sure that there are hand sanitizers across the, the malls and to uh, use visible uh, um, visuals that can help uh, people who enter the malls to take care of their personal hygiene, uh, maintain social distancing. This is also very important. So it, it might be difficult to filter uh, the, the 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 people infected by you know by entering the, the the venue, but you can put in place some engineer systems that are gonna prevent them spreading the virus. 
to other people within uh, the, the building or some other measures like uh, indeed the, the mask, social distancing and temperature. Um, Fajr, just to add to that, I think like what uh, Manuela said in the beginning, you can put processes in place to prevent the spread of any viruses. And uh, what a lot of people forget is if you look at your uh, cleaning regime in your building, to look also at the laundry process. Um, a lot of uh, uh, companies forget to, when they use microfibers, uh, mops or linen, uh, that they have to be washed professionally to be properly disinfected because otherwise they come really contaminated back out if it's, for example, washed with a cheap powder to the wrong temperature, etc. And this is something also to, to add to all the other precautions like hand sanitizer, uh, temperature control measures that the cleaning process inclusive the uh, laundry of any items as well as the waste uh, disposal is a big part of that. Yeah, to prevent the virus from coming in is very difficult. We all hope that a vaccine will come for that. But yeah, I think that still uh, is out there. Maybe um, Shanti, if you, you wouldn't mind. You, Shanti, yes, if you wouldn't mind, maybe it. I can um, just wrap up with a couple of quick things. Um, yes. I think the number one priority for all of the industry and for all of the people in all of the buildings, I think globally, we want to try and bring back our shoppers or our tenants to all the retail environments or the shopping centers or the, or the buildings, wherever they are. But to do that, we must ensure the physical health and well-being of the occupants, the customers, the retailers, the employees. It has to become the number one priority. And that is something that never has been the case before. But now I believe that that is the number one priority in health and wellness. Are, uh, are, are, unless people feel safe and secure when they're coming in, I don't believe that they're going to come back, first of all. And I, and I think also that... Uh, I'm starting to read a little bit more now, and uh, apparently about 80, globally, 80% 80 of the people who uh, were in an office or who were in a shopping center on a regular basis, they now are saying they would like to come back to that way of life. So if we can make health and security and well-being a number one priority, they will come back. So I think that's great. I want to thank you for your time and everybody in the webinar. Thank you, Shanti, and, uh, and thanks thank everyone you, for your interest in joining us today. And we want to thank all the panelists for that. Uh, we, we really appreciate you being here and sharing your knowledge with everyone. So from me, that's it. But thank you very much. And we look forward to being together again as soon as we can. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you.